Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teachers English Language GCSE. In this video, I'm going to be giving you some top tips for Edexcel English Language Paper 1A. That's the 19th century extract with its four questions. There's a separate video coming along your way for 1B momentarily, so do keep your eyes peeled. Uh, this is just a quick one. It's 10 minutes and I'm just going to do a run through of what the paper looks like, give you some top tips. If you want a little bit more detail, do have a little look at my playlist uh, where there are plenty of other resources that breaks down question by question or does a, a full walk and talk through the paper. Um, but for now, let's get started. OK, so the first thing that I would recommend that you do is actually just have a look at the extract. Um, I've mentioned before in my intro that there's a video with a really, really thorough walkthrough that involves process. But um, regardless whether you use that technique, which is called the procurer or not, definitely just have a little look at the extract. And the most important thing you do when just having a look at it before you do any reading is that you make note of the blurb that you're given at the top. This little bit in italics is actually the exam board just giving you a steer about what the extract is all about. And I cannot tell you how many of my wonderful, lovely students who have not read that bit and then gone on to make mistakes about relationships between people or where people are uh, within the story. So this bit here is, is such an important thing. So in this case, it's in this extract, the narrator has traveled through time far into the future for the first time. His time machine has turned over as he's landed. So immediately that gives us so much information about what to expect. And had you not had that, you might have made some mistakes about where this character is. OK, so we've read the blurb and what I also tend to do is before I even read through it, I just have a little look at how it looks. I, you know, just focus in on the length of the paragraphs, whether we've got any short paragraphs like we do here. I look out for things like direct speech, uh, which there aren't any in this case. I just notice it is first person. So a lot of it is just going to be the narrator's thought. So that's just my little look, first of all. Then. The next thing I do is I read the questions. So I, I turn to the question page and I have a little look through and I look through what I'm being asked of. And as I look through the questions, I start just marking out um, where the lines are. So in this case, we've got from lines one to three, identify a word or phrase which describes the color of the clouds. And then from six to ten, give two ways in which the writer shows the narrator is worried using your own words or quotations from the text. So here I go straight off and with my pen, I'm just going to mark out that I've got from lines one to three. So these three ones here and then I've got six to ten. So I've got this section. So I probably put, you know, question one, question two there. And I, I might not even find them at that moment. I might just literally mark it out. If it pops out to me, then obviously I'm going to chuck a highlighter um, through it. Then I'm just going to go back to my questions. Um, and just double check where I am. So lines 12 to 27, how does the writer use language and structure? It's always language and structure to show the narrator's thoughts and feelings about the people he meets, uh, which is sorry, it's missed off the mark. It's worth six marks. And then uh, the biggie, the 15 marker in this extract, there is an attempt to show the narrator's experiences of a future world, evaluate how successfully this is achieved. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark out uh, lines 12 to 27, and I'm going to note that that is actually quite a chunky monkey of a section that they're giving us there. So there's going to be loads of room to play around and to find some interesting ideas. Uh, so that's for my 12 to 12 to 27. OK, I'm then going to do my reading. OK, I'm going to be armed with a pen or a highlighter or something to help me out. And as I'm reading through, the first time I read through, I'll probably find my answers to questions one and two. I'm not going to read it to you now because that's not the point of this, but you can pause me and read it and find your answers as you go. For question one, the most important thing is that you do make sure you're answering the question. Um, so, for example, some people get a little bit confused here and they're just looking out for colours. So someone, for example, that wrote the grey downpour would not get a mark because, of course, it's looking quite specifically for the colours of the cloud. It asks for a word or a phrase. So it means it doesn't want a stonking big sentence. If you wrote the entire sentence from above me down into nothingness, even though it includes the right answer, you're probably not going to get 
the, the mark, all you need to do is write the word brown. If you wrote faint brown, you'd get the mark. If you wrote some faint brown shreds of cloud, you'd get the mark uh, because you're still just including, you're, you're still just writing down a phrase. But it seems like a really silly thing, but it's, you know, it's one mark that you should be able to get like that. So do just make sure you read the question. Same thing for question two. OK, you can literally just separate out your two sections. I think using a quote is the easiest thing. But of course, the example does say, that you can paraphrase as well. Um, and then once you've found your answers, you jot them down, you're going to read through. You're probably going to read this extract at least twice, uh, once to get meaning, and then next time for annotations. That's really important that you don't simply feature spot, that you don't just sit there going, boom, found a simile, right, let's get writing. You've got to make sure that you really do grasp what's going on. They want to see understanding most of all. Then you're obviously going to start thinking about your response to question three. I'm not going into big detail here. If you would like uh, some thorough um, guidance on tackling question three, then I've got other videos in my playlists uh, that you can look at that will either do big focus on the walkthrough or will dial into this question um, and the skills specifically. But just a few reminders about what the, what you need to do. You must include both language and structure. If you're not sure about those two types, then again, check out my video on language and structure features to help you out here. But essentially, language, you're looking at words and images. Structure, you're looking at sentences and how paragraphs are built up. Easiest way of thinking about it. Avoid vague statements. So the question we had were, um, how is language and structure devices used to show his thoughts and feelings? So many of my students would write as a topic sentence, the writer uses language and structure devices to show the narrator's thoughts and feelings. There's nothing specific there. You've still not answered the question. So what specific devices, devices to present what specific thoughts and feelings? OK, the writer uses a short, simple sentence to demonstrate the narrator's shock at what he sees. Yeah, that's specific. Um, make sure that you squeeze everything you can out of each quotation you select. OK, so that means if you pick a nice, I don't know, let's say that you're, gonna, you're looking at a complex sentence that demonstrates the confusion of the narrator. Well, yeah, start by talking about the structural feature of the complex sentence. But then if there's anything to say about the language in there, say it as well. Don't separate out and go, here's my structure point in one paragraph. Here's my language point in another paragraph. No, combine. See if you can comment on juxtaposition, metaphor, a list of three, an emotive verb, all in one paragraph. It will get you more points and save you more time. Always explore effect and impact. There's, it's all very well being able to identify juxtaposition or a complex sentence, but if, if you don't know what the effect of it is, you're not going to get the marks. So always think, what is the intended effect on the reader? And if you can't figure out what advice is, yeah, then stick to the word and what its effect is. So the word and its connotation or stick to something like sentence length and its effect. So if you're sat there thinking, I, know, I, I don't know if that's compound or complex, but I can see that it's really long and then it's followed by a short sentence. Well, use that. Use those words. Yeah, the writer deliberately crafts a long, complicated sentence to demonstrate X, Y and Z and then follows this with a short sentence immediately afterwards to demonstrate shock. OK, so as long as you're exploring the effect and the impact, you can get away with with speaking broadly. So if you can't think what the word class is, put the word. If you're not sure if it's a metaphor or if it's personification or if it's a simile, say the imagery and then comment on effect. Obviously using precise terminology is going to get you a higher mark but there are still ways of doing well without it so those are your basics on question three your basics on question four coming up so this is the big one this is the 15 marker make sure you cover a good range okay so as much of the extract the whole of the extract as you can show your examiner you've read past your question one, two and three section. I've reminded you here of um, our little acronym SPITE uh, that helps you kind of cover a range of different features. So comment on the setting, on the people or the characters, what the big ideas are, how tone is created, or what the events are, like what actually happens. That will help you cover range. Do make sure that your topic sentences are evaluative. 
and specifically linked to the question. OK, so again, make sure you're using another acronym, using your PECs, powerful, effective, compelling, successful, and make sure that you're actually saying something. So in this case, it's a present presentation of, of the future world. OK, so one way that um, the writer successfully presents the future world is by making the people he meets so very different. You've got to have a specific response. Um, I like to use the acronym of JEDGE uh, to differentiate between your standard PEE paragraphs because it reinforces the need for evaluation. So I say judgment and evidence and then justification. So your judgment should have one of your PEX words in, your evidence is your quote, and your justification, why something is effective or powerful. And really useful idea is right at the end, like once you've done, let's say, four or five of these judge paragraphs, because they don't have to be wildly long, try and make an overall judgment. What's the most effective moment? What's the most compelling portrayal of a future world or whatever the question is? OK, so give like your almost your ultimate judgment. Start that paragraph with ultimately. Ultimately, the most effective portrayal of the future world is. Yeah, because then you're 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 almost like summing up your you're evaluating all of your judgments that you've made already. That's it from me. There's m loads more on all of those skills in my playlist. So look out for the longer videos on the walkthrough on question three and four. And then there are short five minute videos on language and structure and on evaluating. OK, so do have a little look, uh, particularly if your exam is coming up in a few days time, which I know the 2023 cohort, if you're watching it, you're, you're, you're revising for Monday. So massive good luck for that. Do look out for another video on uh, Section B. So I'm going to look at the creative writing and then there'll be another one with just like last minute guidance right at the very end. Otherwise, that's it for me. Thank you so much, so much for watching. Thank you so much for subscribing. If you have already already massively appreciated. And if you haven't, uh, do click that button and then you'll get notifications of when the next few videos are available, available, sorry, for you. All right. That's it for me. Thank you again. Happy revising.